Welcome to Genesis Unleashed, the show that unleashes the truth of Genesis and reveals the trap of atheism. It's a trap! Okay, today we're going to talk about what all atheists have to believe, what I believe is a trap of, of atheism that many Christians aren't really aware of. Um, we've probably all known people that uh, claim to be Christians at one point and that somewhere along the way they've given up their faith and they now declare themselves to be atheists. Right, yeah. What had to happen in their minds for them to go from uh, supposedly believing Christian to atheist? Are you asking that seriously? Because, I mean, a lot, depending on who you ask. Well, mostly we had to become skeptics of claims that you are making. That actually is pretty much it. You just sort of have a little bit of introspectiveness and look at the claims that you believe in from a skeptical point of view instead of a dogmatic point of view. And soon enough, you get to the uh, being an atheist bit. However, I think that that's not actually what you want the answer to be, is it? Uh, well, there's three things that all atheists have to believe. That's right. Yeah, you wrote an article on this, Cal, right? And uh, and listed three things. And there were some comments, some feedback from folks that uh, yes, that uh, really hadn't thought of it that way before. Right. But yet, those three points are logically laid out. I'm really glad that you are going to tell me what atheists need to believe. That's that's not setting up a straw man at all, is it? What are those three points? Yeah, we're not trying to pigeonhole people here, but these are three things all atheists have to believe. Number one, they have to believe that God's word can't be trusted as plainly written. That's, of course. That's obvious. That's a weird claim. That's, that's like saying you have to, you know, you don't, in order to not believe in Harry Potter as a real world event, real historical event, you must believe that you cannot trust the words of Dumbledore. I mean, I guess you're right, but Dumbledore isn't real. Uh, second thing they need to believe in is um, millions of years of Earth history. The third thing they need to believe in is evolution. So I guess there weren't any atheists before The Origin of Species was written? That's a hell of a claim. I mean, even if. Even if I, I will do this on your time scale. So you're telling me that for about 5,800 or so years, there was not a single atheist. And that's on your time scale. I'm not even going to go into my time scale. But in your time scale, you are telling me that the first atheist didn't come around. I guess the first atheist must have been Darwin. He was the father of atheism because before... Him, they wouldn't have had an explanation for evolution, therefore they couldn't have been an atheist according to your straw man definition. Correct? Awesome. Why? If you're an atheist, um, you don't believe there's a God, there's a creator, so you must believe in some form of evolution. That's a, it's a right. given. You yeah. have to believe things create themselves. Uh, mm, mm, all the things that are wrong with this. Uh, no and no is pretty much the answer. No, you do not have to believe in some form of evolution at, at all. Um, again, this whole idea that I guess Darwin was the first uh, atheist is what you think, um, is just weird and odd. Like, it's incredibly stupid to think that the first atheist was Charles Darwin, and that before that there weren't any people. Uh, the other thing is, no, you, you know, we can have, you can be an atheist and have yourself a very simple answer of, I don't know where anything came from. And that's actually a pretty good answer. Um, it might not be satisfactory to the curious, but it's a good answer. The second bit, things create themselves. Is this, is this another one of your straw mans? I feel like you don't know what evolution is. Um. Things can't create themselves uh, quickly. It has to occur over millions of years. You need millions of years to believe in, in evolution. Things can't... So, so you don't just have to believe that things have to create themselves. You also have to, have to believe that they can't create themselves quickly. This is funny. So what you're saying is 
No, let me understand this. What you're saying is that we, as atheists, came up with this idea of things creating themselves. And we couldn't just stop there. We had to put in this little condition where things can't create themselves quickly. What? Why? If we're already coming up with this idea of things creating themselves, why would we say they can't do it quickly? We could just say, hey, it did it quickly. It did it, you know, 10,000 years ago, and we are here now. And you know what? If we did that, that would even give you less for you to argue against because you wouldn't, you wouldn't even be able to argue against millions of years. We would be in complete agreement with you in, on the time scales, and then it would just be like, oh, yeah, it just happens, you know, that... 10 million years ago or 10,000 years ago the space and time created itself and then it's quickly formed earth and it quickly formed this puddle of goo that quickly changed into bacteria that quickly changed into man because that's what you want us to say and we could say this because if we were making shit up we could just make up shit like we could just do this and of course um you can't take god's word as plainly written because it's god's word you don't believe in god now, uh, the, uh, the interesting thing about that is that many Christians believe all three of those things. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're not actually saying what atheists need to believe. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make it... You, you're trying to set up two camps. This Calvin Smith, Creation International, Creation Ministers International camp versus atheist camp. This is what you want. You want to create two camps, two camps warring against each other. And you see this giant group of people in the middle. And you want them on your side. But instead of actually saying, hey guys, here is the evidence. Here is why you should come to our side. No, 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 no. Instead of doing that, you're saying, wait guys, if you keep being in the middle, you're not actually in the middle. You're over on the atheist sides. And you really don't want to be on the atheist side, do you? Because, you know, they're going to hell. That's kind of slimy, guys. It's really kind of slimy. Just, just say. Just show positive evidence for your position and convince people that way instead of having this you're either with us or you're against us mentality. Why? Which is kind of scary, and so and so. Your your the the point to that article really was that those Christians who hold to those three things, they believe in evolution. They believe, of course, it's millions of years, right? And uh, well, Genesis, we can't we can't trust God's word in Genesis. They're on the road to atheism. That right. was the point, and that's what got people a little bit a little bit steamed. But work it through, and it's a logical it, reasoning. It is. See, I told you, I told you that that's what they were gonna do. They just want to have these two camps. They don't want anyone in the middle. And they want to make sure that you are either with them or you're against them. And there's nothing in between. Because where most people, um, where I see many Christians kind of start down that path is they start to believe in millions of years. I mean, that's just inundated. It, you know, it's, it's just everywhere, it's isn't it? Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. So you believe in millions of years. Well, automatically, as soon as you accept that as a Christian, you've already accepted one of the other tenets of atheism because... Oh, now they're tenants of atheism. They're not just, you know, things that you have to believe. They're tenants. Uh, I always find it funny how Christians, especially creationist Christians, like to... How, you, how much you like to compare us to religion as if it's a bad thing. And trust me, I think it's a bad thing to be compared to religion. But that's the side you're on. Why are you saying, look, guys, they're just as bad as religion, what we are? I don't, like, why are you insulting yourself? Now you look at God's word, because nowhere in the Bible is millions of years mentioned. I think, I think Kelvin here brings up a really interesting idea, where if it's not mentioned in the Bible, it's not true. That's pretty much what he said here. He's, he's saying, in millions of years, was never in, mentioned in the Bible, therefore, it can't be true. And so if we extrapolate this to every other scientific idea that wasn't mentioned in the Bible, which would be all of it, therefore none of these other scientific things can be real because they don't 
they weren't mentioned in your book. So automatically you say, well, yeah, millions of years of Earth history is true. Well, you can't really read the Bible as plainly written. Genesis yeah, doesn't seem to indicate to, that. You so have to twist that around. Right. And now, if you're going to accept secular interpretations of history, uh, as far as geology and, and, and Earth history go, why wouldn't you accept secular interpretations of biology, of, of, sure. of evolution? Yeah. And so there are many uh, Christians, and we've mentioned this before, that of course you can be a Christian and an evolutionist. That's not the criteria for, for Christianity. However, you've started down that slope where... I'm glad that you said slope because you get... And I could see it. I could see it in your face. You wanted to say slippery slope. But you know that if you said that, everyone was going to call you out on it and tell you how you're making a slippery slope argument. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what you're doing. You're, you're making a slippery slope argument. So maybe stop? You've started down that slope where where now if something occurs in your life, maybe some kind of hurt or, or something like that in the church, we've all heard these types of stories, um, you now have an intellectual way to, uh, to explain why, wow, you know, there is no God or maybe you can turn your back on God or, or something like right. that. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this again. This whole like, oh, atheists are just hurt little people who were, they were, you know, hurt by religion in some way, and therefore they don't, they don't want to believe in God because they're, they're emotionally hurt. They're emotional creatures. They got hurt, and then they just turned their backs from God. It's, you know, I won't, I want to one day find a clip of, of you two talking about people switching from another religion to Christianity so that I can make this exact same argument about why you are converting people from, say, Islam to Christianity. And I can say, oh, well, you just got, they're only switching over because Islam hurt them in some way. And then they, they decided to go become Christians, you know, in order to turn their backs on Allah, not because they're intellectually honest or because they actually wanted to be Christians. No, 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 no. It's because Islam hurt them and they wanted to turn their back on it. Um, and, you know, many times, uh, you know, I, I've met Christians that say, well, Cal, listen, you know, this is a modern age. This is a modern society. We, we've got to accept science here. You know, we, we don't want to be seen as, you know, Christians from the dark ages and we don't believe in science. And I mean, obviously, Genesis is just mythology. I mean, look at it. You know, yes. you've got a talking yes. snake yeah. in there. I mean, you know, it's poetic, et cetera, et cetera. But one of my, so I teach. That's my day job. And one of my favorite times of the year is early on in first grade, where we teach that we teach the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And this is a very important step in young readers. So we start giving them fiction books that are very obviously fiction, Berenstein Bears, for example. And then we compare it to very non, very obviously nonfiction books, books about sports, books about soccer books with facts in them and we talk about what the difference is one of the first criteria that we teach first graders to tell that something is fiction or non-fiction is we teach them that if there's an animal talking it's fiction that way they can differentiate between a soccer book and a berenstein's bear book about soccer and they can differentiate which one's fiction and non-fiction so by the first couple of months of first grade, most first graders know to ask themselves, is there a talking animal? Then it must be fiction. And, and we, need to, we need to, I guess, define what, 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 what folks mean by science. Most of the time when people say we need to accept science is we need to accept man's understanding, man's interpretation of right. certain rock layers and radioisotope dating that obviously points to millions of years. That's what they mean by science. Right. No, but by science, we legitimately mean science, you know, observation, hypothesis, experimentation, rinse, repeat science. Um, I know that you have a weird definition of science, and that's because having your definition of science is easier for you to swallow than it is in, in the same way that you have your own definition of atheist, because that's also easier for you to swallow. But that's not actually the definition that the rest of us use. And so even many Christians are saying, well, obviously, you know, the talking snake or whatever. It, it's got to be poetic. Science has proven this and that. But let's think about it here. 
But what about the talking don donkey in Deuteronomy? That's, that's actually another good reason to think that the Bible is made up, that there's a talking donkey in Deuteronomy. Also, I mean, I, you can sit here and talk about the things that don't match up with what we know about reality and what the Bible says. And you and and I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and list them off because I have a feeling that you have heard most of these Calvin and I have a feeling that you have figured out a way to what how did how did your partner here put it Oh yeah, do a little bit of twisting about the facts to make it fit your reality. I mean, are, are we supposed to study scripture based on what modern science, you know, interpretations are revealing? Yeah. Uh, if, I, I mean, if we do that, what are you left with? A virgin birth? Well, science can prove that that's impossible. Right. A human walking on water? That's that's impossible. How, how about happen. the floating axe head uh, uh, experiment? Yeah, right. Let, let's yeah. try that one and see if it works. I've never out. seen one. I. <laughs> I love it. You are so close. You two are sitting here laughing about it in the face of, of knowing that there's unscientific things in the Bible. You see it. You hear it. You even talk to each other about it. You don't just ignore it. And instead of actually being introspective and, and thinking about your beliefs, you laugh it off. You are actually enjoying your own ignorance, aren't you? We believe in a supernatural God. Obviously, if you're going to believe in Christ's uh, uh, virgin conception, his birth, his death, his resurrection, the miracles he performed, uh, you cannot go to science to dictate on wh wh what, the, what the scripture is saying there. You just take it as plainly written. Right. And, and so this is one a, of the points in your article is, is that that's exactly what some Christians are doing. They're, right. they're saying, well, no, no, we'll accept the miracles elsewhere in scripture, but we won't accept the miracle of creation because that's unscientific. Right. It's, well, it's how inconsistent. inconsistent is that? <laughs> exactly. I really love the fact that you two are so consistent. I think it's wonderful. And I honestly wish more Christians were like that because it makes it really easy later on for us to actually, and I'm going to tell you how I turn Christians into atheists. It makes it so much easier later on to go in and point out just one of these things that's unscientific, one of the things that you laughed at, and tell them, well, if this one thing is unscientific, how can you trust the rest of your book? And because of people like you who told them that it's an all or nothing, that you either accept the whole Bible as scientifically true, or you accept it as scientifically false because of this, it is because you create this all or nothing mentality, it is so much easier to later on go in and point out the flaws and say, it's an all or nothing thing, because I agree with you, it's an all or nothing. You either believe in it entirely or you disbelieve it entirely. And you know what I have found? I have found that more people are willing to entirely disbelieve the Bible than they are to partition off the parts of the Bible they want to believe and the parts they don't. And it's all thanks to guys like you who tell them that they are not allowed to partition the Bible, that they must believe the whole thing or none of it at all. So despite all of, all of Collins, uh, uh, his high level uh, of standing in science, I mean, uh, I don't think anyone would dispute that Dr. Collins is a, is a leading scientist of our age. I mean, of involved course. in the Human Genome Project there years ago. Uh, and yet, because he claims to be a Christian, right. even though he doesn't believe in creation, he's a theistic evolutionist, he's labeled a clown by That's the right. evolutionists. Isn't that interesting? No, 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 no. He's not labeled as a clown by the evolutionists. Um, evolutionists, as you like to call, I guess, people who believe in evolution, make up a big, big percent of the population, including the scientific, um, the scientifically minded. What you have is you have a couple of atheists, P.Z. Myers and Sam Harris, who came out and criticized Francis Collins, Dr. Francis Collins. They don't represent every evolutionist, and no, nor could they represent every evolutionist. They at best can represent atheists. But to say that they represent every evolutionist, including Christians, evolutionists, Muslim evolutionists, atheist evolutionists, is 
Man, you are giving them way more power than they actually have. You are talking as if these two men actually hold the same opinion as about half of the population of the United States. That's ridiculous. They they can't. They don't. They Yes, they agree with about half of the population on the evolutionary aspect, but they don't agree with them on the theistic aspect. They agree with at what is at this point only about you know 10 percent so to say that they represent all evolutionists is just downright wrong i've heard all sorts of terminology and i'm sure many people have i mean you know to argue that well if we don't accept science in this area in millions of years and all that stuff we're, we're people are going to think you're a moron i mean people throw words like that around right but folks if you believe that a virgin human female gave birth, they think, they think the same we're thing, and they, anyway. they use the it's, same terminology. It's, it's, you are you get so close every time. You get so so close that you understand. I feel like you understand why believing in a virgin birth is wrong, and you understand why it's unscientific. You understand these things, but you never actually apply this understanding to your belief you just say oh i understand why people think i'm crazy but and then you laugh it off you giggle it off oh and then then actually you do something that's a little bit worse oh god and the bible talks about persecution and so on that if, if right. we follow christ we can expect that kind of reaction from many right. people i love this whole christian persecution complex you have created yourself such a nice little insular bubble where you can say, you know what, if they're against me, I should expect that because God told me they'd be against me. Not, not because I am wrong, but because I am a Christian. And mind you, you're not the only group of people who do this. Uh, every political, social political movement um, like yours likes to have this idea of, oh, they're persecuting us because of a particular trait or a particular belief that I hold, and never because I might actually be wrong. Uh, creationists, Christian creationists often like to point to their Christianity, and so do, say, the GOP in America like to point to the Christianity as to why they are often attacked. They do this in order to deflect attention to the actual reason they're, they're being attacked. For example, and I know that this is about three years after your video here, but nowadays, um, gay marriage is legal in the United States. And it's never, to Christians, it's never about gay marriage. It's always about an attack on Christianity. Um, and I shouldn't say never because someone's going to point me out a secular argument against gay marriage or whatever, but... Christians and other political groups like to hide behind their perceived minority status in order to say, oh, you are persecuting me for this one aspect about my life, and it has nothing to do with my, my argument or my ideas or what I'm presenting. You often want to say that you, know, you are attacked because of your Christianity, when in fact you are being attacked because you believe some really ridiculous shit. And I know that these two things go hand in hand, being a Christian and believing ridiculous things, but as someone like Francis Collin has shown it, it doesn't have to go hand in hand. It doesn't have to be this, you know, one or the other. You either believe in your insane version of history or you aren't a Christian. You can actually have that bit in the middle. But I know what you're trying to do. You want to create two camps. You want to make, you know, the good guys versus the bad guys because, I don't know, I guess you think your audience are children and don't enjoy subtlety or, you know, gray areas. That might be too much work to handle. And I honestly think that this is how you see your audience. I don't see your audience this way. I think your audience is full of very intelligent people who could, in fact, tolerate middle ground but i don't think you think that your audience is capable of that biblical creation uh, founded in the understanding of presuppositional apologetics that we we presuppose things uh before we look at the evidence sure. etc we've talked about this before just like the evolutionist does yes <laughs> i love this bit 
It's it's this I'm rubber, you're glue, everything you say bounces off me and sticks to you argument that you're using, and it's hilarious. Um, no, we don't really presuppose much in the scientific communities. Um, at best, you could argue, at best, the thing that is presupposed is that the scientific method is the best way of understanding reality. Everything else isn't presupposed, it's concluded. Um, the things that you say are presupposed are conclusions, they're not presuppositions. You want to have your presuppositions. You want to be able to say, oh, I'm, I'm just going to assume God is real and then get to God that way because that isn't circular reasoning. And the only reason that I'm allowed to do this is because, see, those other guys, they're doing it too. It's one of the best immunizers against uh, apostasy because for someone like myself or yourself to go from believe bible believing christian to atheist we'd have to take all these steps you'd have to start accepting all these three things but many christians they're already there they're ripe for the plucking in the sense that they already believe the fundamental tenets of atheism right. like i said earlier the reason that we have grown as the atheist community has i think very little to do with your three supposed things that atheists must believe I think that the reason that the atheist community has grown so substantially has everything to do with you. Has everything to do with people like you, Calvin, and your organization, Creation Ministries, and organizations like Answers in Genesis and Ken Ham. And it's because you hold this idea of either you're with us or you're against us. And that, I think, has been easily the most detrimental thing to your, to your movement because you have made it so much easier for us to come in, point out one thing that is wrong, and because you have conditioned your followers to say that's either all wrong or all right, that pointing out one thing easily, easily leads people away from Christianity and towards atheism.